not go out into space, but instead are reflected back down. Uh, so uh, it turns out uh, during the daytime, the critical frequency where signals come up or back down is up to about 10 megahertz. So you can work true NVIS, very close range propagation, up to about 30 meters during the daytime. At night, the NVIS, NVIS propagation, especially at the bottom of the sunspot cycle, you better have something on 160 meters. What does that stand for? Near vertical, ionospheric. Uh, so, oh, what's the S? Near vertical. Skyway. Yeah. Skyway. <coughs> Skyway is any uh, propagation that goes off to the ionosphere, as opposed to ground. Um, so daytime up to about 30 meters. So 40 and 30 meters are really good NVIS bands during the day. 80 is terrible because of the delay of absorption. At night, the electron density goes way down, so the critical frequency drops way below 10 megahertz. In the summer and the fall, you can work 80 meters NVIS at night, but at this part of the sunspot cycle, you better have something for 160. But you can't work, you can't work the guy in the next state on uh, Skywave on 80 meters because he's too close. Talking about a ground wave? Okay, so ground wave is totally unrelated to anything we've discussed. <coughs> totally unrelated, because it doesn't rely on the ionosphere. It relies on two kinds of propagation. If you download near the AM broadcast band, the actual name of that is called uh, surface wave, where the, the wavelengths are long enough that the propagation actually hugs the Earth as it, as it moves along. And if anybody most people don't listen to AM radio. Does anybody listen to AM radio? Oh, a few people yeah. listen. <laughs> Have you ever driven to a beach on the ocean? And what happens? You can hear signals in the wind one during the day, and that's the, the surface wave coming across the ocean where it's not attenuated very much. So if you drive to Ocean City or Atlantic City on the, in New Jersey, uh, and with, a, with an AM radio in your car, you can listen to broadcast stations in New England at high, at high noon. Drive three or four miles inland, and they're gone. So that's that's surface wave. So you used to listen to winds coming through the uh, Straits of Gibraltar. Yep, yep. Um, probably not in the daytime. No, no, at, at night. Yep. Um, the other kind of so-called ground wave uh, occurs on 80 meters and above. And that is actually electromagnetic radi radiation directly from one antenna to another and not hugging the Earth. The wavelengths are short enough. And that mostly just depends upon line of sight. So it's true line of sight propagation direct from one antenna to another, not having much to do with the Earth. Uh, but, it, but distance does matter because eventually the curvature of the Earth gets to you and then one antenna can't see the other. And the, the actual distance that ground wave works on, true ground wave, uh, 80 meters and above, is about one and a half times the visual horizon. But then you say, Frank, I can hear people 200 miles away on 80 meters during the daytime. They're weak, but I can still hear them. Well, it's other kinds of sky waves and other propagation that's weakly propagated. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so these, these are some of the measures of uh, the amount of uh, radiation hitting the sun. One is called solar flux. It's, it's been measured for years and years at 10.7 centimeters. Why? You can't, thank God, you can't measure UV radiation on the Earth. Otherwise, we'd all be burned and we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> so you can't measure UV, uh, ionizing UV radiation on the Earth. It's all been stripped away by all these oxygen atoms that have, been, have their electrons pulled away, and by the time the UV radiation would have gotten to the Earth, it's gone. It, did, it spent all of its energy stripping electrons. So it doesn't get here. So you can't measure UV radiation on the Earth. But what they discovered is that at this microwave range, that radiation is highly correlated with uh, UV radiation. About 2.85 gigahertz. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Okay, so and the, the, these are two measures of disturbed conditions. K index 
important thing to remember all about that is it's updated every three hours. So it's near real time. Whereas the A index is a 24 hour measure of the amount of geomagnetic activity, that means disturbance, for yesterday. Yesterday's number, not today's. So if you hear somebody say, boy, wasn't the A index high today? Well, we don't know how high it was today because the, it was measured yesterday. So it's, it's like driving down the Jersey Turnpike with, with the blinders on the front windshield looking out the rear view mirror. The K index is the real time. Uh, and, they, and they correspond with, uh, yeah, I know a lot of the Jersey drivers drive that way. Uh, so the high numbers mean a bad thing for propagation. And A index is yesterday's numbers. Uh, you know, I usually ignore them. So we've already talked about a lot of these topics, so I won't go through that again. There's a couple of things that I do want to. We've already talked about LUF. We've already gone through all that, so we don't need to do that again. Oh, uh, this is what happens above the critical frequency. When the NVIS fails, the, the, the radio signal actually penetrates the ionosphere and goes out to space. So as the day goes on, and the critical frequency goes down at lower and lower frequencies. The signals don't get refracted by the electron density. They pass right through and head on off to the next gap. Okay. We're talking about ground wave, 168 meters only, surface wave or space wave. That's somewhat beyond the line of sight. Talk about sky wave. Talked about critical frequency already. Uh, here's some of the numbers. Typical critical so critical frequencies relate to NVIS. Above these frequencies, the signals go out into space. So summer daytime about nine megahertz. Uh, winter daytime much higher, 14 megahertz. Why is that? Because the electron density is created. Remember the balloon effect over the stove. So you're all the way up to 20 meters. You can you can work NVIS on good days on 20 meters but almost every day uh, in the winter on uh, 30 meters. And then at night, uh, you better have a good 160 meter antenna, particularly in this part of the sunspot side. And because we're interested in the thing straight up, the antennas don't have to be very high. So our field the antennas work great. Simple horizontally polarized antennas. 20 to 30 feet high, fantastic. There's another view of what happens when the signals are above the critical frequency and they just go out into space. They get refracted a little bit, but eventually they escape and go into space. And then uh, this is the MUF right here, where the signal goes at the greatest distance. And this is the LUF in here. And then there's this thing called the skip zone, where if you're in that skip zone, you can hear one end of the QSO, but not the other. So you can hear the guy. In, you can hear if there's a guy in uh, Connecticut working someone in London. You can hear the guy in London. You can't hear the guy in Connecticut. So we talk about that. And I think we talked about that. Surface wave goes to short distance. And there's another thing called backscale, which tends to fill in the skip zone somewhat. Uh, some of the signals that refract off the ionosphere and come back to the Earth, when they hit the Earth, some of them get bounced back <coughs> towards the transmitter. And uh, you can often, in the skip zone, so in this region here, the skip zone, you can sometimes hear weak signals that are bounced back. <coughs> from that and fading uh, is caused by signals that are propagating across the ionosphere in multiple paths. And fading can be fast, as it, as it often is for signals that pass over the Earth. Arctic regions, that part of the ionosphere is very unstable, or very slow, like on um, 10 meters late in the evening. So we, I think we talked about sunspot number. There's an interesting form of propagation called transequatorial. And I think that was a factor in that QSO that I mentioned between North America and New Zealand. Uh, that tends to be F layer propagation near the equator. So chances are that New Zealand propagation so here's, here's New Zealand way over here. It's probably E layer over here that's somehow coupled into this TEP over the, over the Pacific, probably around the Cook Islands here and up around Hawaii here, and then coupled across the United States into maybe a, a, a winter E layer. 
something like that. So there were at least at least three different kinds of propagation involved in that very rare, very, very rare Maryland to New Zealand contact. And I wasn't the only one. Dozens of people made those contacts. So somebody right. mentioned gray line. Right. And here's what the map looks like. Yes. On that previous slide. Yeah. Something I've always wondered. On the map. That yeah. wiggly line in the middle. This line? Yeah, what is that? Okay. So if you look closely, it says geomagnetic equator. Something I haven't mentioned yet. So here's what's happening there. See, what, does anybody know roughly where the magnetic pole is on the Earth? Roughly? Hudson Bay, Canada. Yeah, it's, it's north of Hudson, Hudson Bay. <coughs> but it's way south of the geographic oh, equator. So, so this kind of map, Okay. The equator kind of runs right across here, right? Through Ecuador, but it's a straight line. But, it, but the geomagnetic equator isn't up here. It's way up here. Uh -huh. Right about there. So, it, so for the part of the Earth that's near the equator, near the geomagnetic pole, or the magnetic pole, geo just means Earth. So for the part of the Earth that's near here, the geomagnetic equator is pushed south. You're halfway between the north and the south pole? Well, with the, with the, the magnetic, magnetic pole. Between, yeah, between the magnetic pole. And I don't remember where the south yeah. magnetic pole is, but it's somewhere in Antarctica, and it's not near, the, not, near, not near where you expect it to be. So this gets pushed south, and over on the other side of the Earth, the geomagnetic equator, the real equator is over here somewhere, so it gets pushed north. So, and it's very frustrating. These dotted lines show transequatorial propagation. And our bodies in Europe can routinely work transequatorial propagation on six meters into uh, the area around South Africa. Works perfect. But the poor guys in North America, our geomagnetic equator is pushed way down south into Brazil. And unless you look in Florida, you can't work TEP unless you get lucky. Right. Because that New Zealand Christmas thing was probably TEP. So it was probably some kind of e-layer that got the signal from Maryland over to California. And then it linked across the magnetic equator with TEP here. And then wound up here in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand. Definitely by an e-layer path as it was focused. Aren't the poles supposed to be flipping sometime soon? Yeah. The stories I've heard. Well, not. well, sometimes a long time, but I don't think you and I need to worry about that. <laughs> wouldn't that wouldn't that effect mean no magnetic poles for some period? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. I don't think we'll we be long gone. <laughs> I saw a, I saw a documentary from NASA uh, on the NASA channel that the uh, flipping of the poles were actually overdue for it already. Yeah. But I don't think we're not talking about human lifetimes here. <laughs> we're, we're talking about periods of time that are probably measured in thousands and tens of thousands of years. Yeah, 10, ten to fifteen thousand years. Yeah, something like that. But we're already over the time period yeah. that it should have flipped. I wouldn't worry about it anymore. Well. <laughs> <laughs> By any comment. And, uh, and of course, the last time it flipped, which was probably ten thousand years ago. We don't have record, so we don't know what happened. Yes, but will my VHS collection still work? <laughs> okay, so here's the gray line. So we talked about that. The tape so <laughs> it's really interesting. For anybody that operates 40 meters, for example, so, as, as the, so this is daylight, and this is darkness. And as the afternoon goes on, this thing called the terminator, or hams called the gray line, moves further and further, and here in New Jersey at, a, at this time of year at about 5.30 in the afternoon, it starts to get dark. Mm -hmm. And if you can launch a radio wave along this thing that Cam's called the Gray Line, right along this boundary, where do they wind up? Japan. <laughs> there's a lot of hams in Japan. So it's, it's, very, it's very easy to work from the United States to Japan by going three quarters of the way around the, around the Earth by following this daylight darkness boundary. You can also work into Western Australia. Uh, there's, there's not as much ham activity in Western, Western Australia, but there's enough. Um, so that's what gray line is. Is it in morning gray line or in afternoon gray line? Uh, 
Well, it happens at both times. So in our afternoon, so let's just imagine that this whole map slides left about an inch. So in our afternoon in December, January, we can use, work the gray line three quarters of the way around the Earth to Japan. Now let's pretend that this is light. I don't have another map. That this is light and this is dark here. Well, the other thing that happens is that they well, maybe an easy thing to pretend. Let's pretend that we're over, this is the United States over here. So the, the gray line, instead of being southeast towards Brazil, towards the South Atlantic, in the morning, the sunrise, it's kind of southwest. So you're kind of pointing down over New Zealand. So uh, the, the gray line propagation at our sunrise kind of allows us to... I wish I had a map showing this, but, but this area winds up kind of over here, around India and Southeast Asia. So in our sunrise, you can kind of work this same path, point southwest instead of southeast, and the signal winds up in uh, South Asia. So you can work stations in India, Thailand. There's not a lot of hams there, so there's not as much activity. The opening is the same as it is in the afternoon. But it's open to parts of the world where there aren't as many hands. Does it work the other way too, like northwest and northeast instead of <coughs> southwest? Well, the, the time when this, see, if I had maps of the whole year, you could see it. But most of this 40 meter propagation occurs during our winter. During, during the summer, the night is very short. So, you know, at this time of year, the night lasts, what, 15 hours maybe? Hmm. Darkness from 5.30 and well, let's say December from 4.30 in the afternoon until 7.30 in the morning. So we've got 15 hours of darkness. But in the summer, these same things are here, but it's mostly, most of the benefit of it is in the southern hemisphere where the nights are long. And my, so my question was, to do that, you point the beam like southeast. Yeah, in, in our afternoon, so at 5 in the afternoon. But if you pointed it northwest, would it do the same thing around the other Yes. Way? Yes, you, and, but that's, uh, yes, you, and you can also work Japan at that, in that direction. Um, like the northern route. But here's the problem, and, and this shows most of that path is in daylight. So it really only works well on 40 meters at the very dead bottom of the sunspot cycle when the absorption here is reduced. So for most of the, most of the sunspot cycle, in the afternoon of 40 meters, if you want to work Japan, it's three quarters of the way around the Earth, just in this darkness period here, where the D layer is inactive and the E layer is very weak, but only in the dead bottom of the sunspot cycle, like maybe in 2018, will you be able to work this path here, pointing northwest uh, over to Japan. And the reason is there's too much daylight. So the absorption, even though the path is a lot shorter, there's too much absorption in all this daylight. And the darkness is way up here in this Arctic region where there's all kinds of disturbed propagation. You're referring to D-layer absorption. D-layer absorption in the day in the day time and then E-layer absorption right along this area. So as the E-layer fades away, because it's very active in the middle of the day, it fades away in the afternoon. It's not so much a reflecting area as it just absorbs signals that are passing through it. Okay, we talked about NVIS. This kind of shows how the M, remember we talked about 20 meters in the daytime? This is showing over time, remember that's the terminator right there, that's showing over time how the critical frequency or the MUF or NVIS changes with day and night. You need a different set of antennas for nighttime NVIS than you do in daytime, especially in the winter. Right, we've got about five minutes. Yep, I think we're almost done. So uh, we could use the Aurora to work uh, on the VHF bands, mostly. Has anybody ever worked Aurora? Oh, yeah. uh, what does it sound like? Uh, well, on voice, the guy sounds like he's talking like a water. <laughs> on CW, the tone is sharp. Raspy. That's right. Yeah, raspy. That's right. So that is true atmospheric propagation. Yeah. On the HF bands, it sounds like flutter. On the VHF bands, it turns a nice clean CW node into it. And then sometimes you can't understand. The harder you go, you can't hear, right? You right. can't, it's hard to work voice on something. Yeah. And I talk about backscatter. Uh, 
this is the aurora is in this area called the auroral oval. This is the night side pushed uh, down and the day side back here. Uh, we talked about auroral backscatter just now. It can go all the way up to 450 megahertz with a very intense aurora. It's rare when it happens. Um, so I think that's about as much as we've got time to do. I just want to mention one more thing. Reverse beacon network. Does anybody use that? Oh, day long. It's fantastic. <laughs> I love it. So here's what it is. I'm going to end with this. Uh, www.reversebeacon.net. What it does, it has over 100 receivers all over the world that uh, send their data into this website. Um, so just get on the air and call two CQs and send your call twice. So CQ, CQ, W3LP, LW3LP. CW already. CW already. Already. And then go to this website and take a look at what receivers are doing. And then you can tell what kind of, without knowing anything about propagation, you can just look at what receivers and where in the world they heard you. If you go on 80 meters during the daytime, all these receivers in Philadelphia and New York are going to hear you. Go on 10 meters and nobody's going to hear you. Is that, is that fully automated or, or are there like actually people doing that? <laughs> yeah, there's 10,000 people in the world. It's going to give you your simple strength, your CW speed, your frequency you want. It's computers. That's so 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 what so we they, never imagined. They, 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 so they, they actually. Now, literally, all you have to do is get on the air, CQ, CQ, W3LPL, W3LPL. That gives the computer a chance to make a few mistakes. But just two CQs, call sign twice. Okay. And then look there and see who heard you. You don't have to know anything about propagation. Everything I told you is unnecessary. So, 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 so basically, basically they did. Okay, so that's, that's it. The easiest way to prove that means. Just the audience. That's right, exactly. That's how you know. Exactly. Let's get You're actually solving power. Right. Right. I can tell how the band is. I started five watts for the CQ. And then increase two hundred right, yeah. watts. By the time I hit five hundred watts, I mean I'm getting hundreds of spots yeah. on the European. So you do anything like that scientist? I love it. I'm on three, four hours a day. Yeah. Like Twenty and seventeen. But you should try making QSOs with people instead. I do. My fun's there. <laughs> If you want to learn more, uh, I guess these slides will be available for people to look at on the website. But the best way to learn more if you're really interested is to look at some of these topics and plug it into Google. And then you can get all kinds of accurate information. You get all, you get all kinds of stuff that's really long. <laughs> 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 Tree come with the antenna. <laughs> Double oh, your Christmas box. tree. Oh. Oh. Frank has been gracious enough to invite us all to his picnic in the summer. Uh, you can also hear, as I have in the past, uh, several of, of uh, Frank's presentations at Dayton. Uh, he usually fills a 400 room standing room only, plus the 400 seated people at Dayton for any of his presentations, which are always interesting in many different ways. He talks about the history of radio, what happened, you know, 50 years ago, whatever. Somebody will raise their hand as we did here and say, well, what about and whoosh, all of it, down, down another street? We down in the weeds we go. But we really appreciate you coming, Frank. And I, 
If you come up a moment. Fairlawn Radio Club is proud to present you with Hey, very nice. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> I just should. Yeah? I just should. Okay. Oh, no, I did. did. I did. You did? Yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks, Jim. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks again for coming. Thank thanks you. for everybody. Uh, tomorrow and Sunday, we'll be operating the BHF contest and the uh, North American QSO party at the club station, opening at 12 noon and working until 9 o'clock on either or contest, both days. Oh, on Sunday, we don't open until. No, we have 10 a.m. on Sunday. <laughs> noon, noon, noon tomorrow and 10 a.m. on Sunday. And uh, anybody is welcome to come. Even if you're not a ham, you can come and get on the air with us. We'll teach you what to do. You can log for us. You can do all sorts of stuff. So stop by the club. And thanks again for coming. Thank you.